I think the biggest thing I see, uh, and this is kind of for emotion more, I think it's the belief. I think it's the belief that I, I'm going to build a scalable world-class company here. So now people don't even, you know, if you go back, people are thinking about, can you build a $100 million business? People are talking about billion dollar in their income, right? So I think the scale is totally different and the belief is is a totally different level altogether, right? And of course, the, the quality of entrepreneurs also change a lot. I think we are seeing very much better talent coming in, you know, really, really good people who are leaving their jobs or, or coming out of uh, very good institutes and starting up uh, as teams. Hello and welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. I'm Roshan Karyapa. Manav Garg founded Eka Software in 2004 when there were just a handful of product companies around. The SaaS ecosystem in India has come a long way since then. Manav recently wrote and compiled a book called The India SaaS Story, where he gets Indian founders like Sridhar Vembu of Zoho, Girish Matrabudam of Freshworks, Chris Subramanyam of Chargebee, Abhinav Astana of uh, Postman and others to share real insights on important aspects like fundraising and hiring based on their experience. In this conversation, we discuss Manav's journey, the book itself, which I highly encourage everyone should get, and of course, the evolution of SaaS in India. This was a fascinating conversation. And without further ado, let's get started on this episode of the Startup Popular Podcast with Manav Kirk. Hey, Manav, welcome to the Startup Popular Podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks for having me, Roshan. Yeah, and uh, thank you also for writing and compiling this splendid book, The India SaaS Story. I think it's a must read for SaaS founders and enthusiasts uh, everywhere. So we'll get to the book in a bit, but I thought I'd begin with revisiting some lessons from the pandemic, right? Lately, I'm just going back and listening to all of the stuff that was said there uh, at that time, including, you know, Sequoia's Black Swan blog, which is now famous and uh, so on. And I heard your SaaS Boomi podcast as well. And uh, I think the wisdom in it is is timeless. I mean, it's easily relevant even now. I, I'm paraphrasing whatever you said, so I may get things slightly off. But you said something to the effect of don't try to be too smart and predict, you know, when this will all be over, plan for the long term, nine to 12 months out, uh, and look at your cash flows regularly, communicate with your employees, investors, customers, and so on, right? So all of which is uh, really relevant even now. So when you look back, what are some of those things that you were right about that you got uh, absolutely right? And what are some things that you, you know, you didn't get right? I think my approach to any crisis, you know, in the life of an entrepreneur, you know, you go through ups and downs and I have a fairly long journey in entrepreneurship right now, you know, as compared to the startups today. So I think the, the key learning that I have is that stick to fundamentals, right? So when I made that point, when pandemic hit, of course, there was a huge amount of uncertainty in the market and it was a black, or it is a black swan even and nobody knew, know that, you know, how it will go to pan out. So in that case, what we looked at is fundamental. So fundamental of running any business is looking at your cash flows, right? Looking after your customers, looking after your employees, and of course, looking after your investors. And of course, and looking after yourself, which is mindfulness, right? Which, which, which I also speak about quite a bit. So I think if you look at those fundamental principles, what we talk about. So whenever any crisis happens, the first thing that can, what can hurt the company most is not having cash. Because in any crisis situation, cash is a scarce commodity. Cash becomes the king. Till such time, there is more clarity. There's more predictability, I would say, right? Then people are more comfortable investing behind the predictable scenarios, right? And take their own risk uh, assessment of the situation and give you the money. So therefore, managing your cash was the most important piece at that point in time. Therefore, when you look at the cash, it has two components. Customers has to be happy so they can continue to give you cash. And your employees has to be with you just in case you have to delay the salaries. And a lot of lot of our companies in SaaS for me did delay salaries. People did delay bonuses and, and employees have been really, really supportive, you know, in during that time frame, right? All of us kind of work together to get to the situation. What I did not get right was there's an upside now is that the digital acceleration will be that fast. If you look at it in that in that blog and in that webinar. We never thought that, you know, we were going to look at 10x digitization. We didn't think that there's going to be a massive upside. And we didn't think that SaaS will become a secular trend, which it has become today now, right? We did a report with McKinsey where we were projecting SaaS to be a trillion dollar market cap by 2030, right? And Indian SaaS can have 6% market share of that. So we could not think of the scale at that point in time, very frankly speaking. No clue. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen this personally as well. I mean, how some of the large enterprises in Asia uh, have kind of sassified over the last two years is tremendous, right? I also want to touch upon a few of your values, right? Which I've gleaned from different places. One of which is passion with reason. And you, you talk about a few things you've read, Khalid Gibran and so on, right? So when you look back at the last couple of years, uh, do any stories, anecdotes come to mind where, you know, this passion with reason was combined uh, uh, by either portfolio startups of yours uh, or, you know, any friends or anything that uh, any any people that you saw uh, close to you? Yes, yeah, so I think we see it all the time. I'll give you some simple examples first, right? Now, if you look at stock market did not behave as the whole world is going through crisis. There's a medical crisis, there's a personal crisis, a business crisis, and stock market went to the highest, right? So 
you go around in a room and all of your friends will say you know we are the best i'm generating 30% return and 60% return so people get passionate right there's no reason behind it right so so then you are in the frenzy of this passion and then when the market suddenly turns around which is turning around then you end up losing money right suddenly now people are thinking oh what should i do with my investment i i started investment in that frenzy right so that is typically passion with reason is also equivalent of you know greed and fear in the stock markets right so that is a kind of phenology to think about it so similarly when you look at any startup journey or like my own entrepreneurial journey right when you get your first few customers you are very passionate you think you got everything right your product is right you are the best sales person you are you are the best product team you are the best investors on board right reason is what keeps you in check which means if you look at the matrix is customer really happy did you do survey did you meet them quite often did you go to market did you are you going and in touch with your employees in a meaningful way that brings a little bit more of sense to the passion that you have and that is a constant struggle that entrepreneur goes through in your in, in your journey as an entrepreneur right so this is for example right now there is a frenzy of investment coming into saas mm. you know we're looking at seed capital valuation crazy valuation people are raising you know 3 years back you couldn't get even 500k now you can get 5 million dollars for for seed capital right so now there's lot more money chasing the saas as an asset class right as an ecosystem but doesn't mean that your business has certainly become big or you certainly you become better right it's mm-hmm. just that you have more risk capital coming so i think a passionate entrepreneur with a reason will say okay yes it is the right time for me to raise capital so let me raise capital but i will spend it really really well i will build the company with first principles because i am in for a long haul i am going to be here for minimum 10 years or 20 years or even even lifetime so therefore i have to build a reasonable company which has cash flows revenues you know customer happiness so that is what i'm calling the, you know this is the best example of of passion with reason so when people are passionate you know everybody just feeds into frenzy you know and then just people forget there is a reason behind it right yeah i definitely want to revisit that uh, fundraising bit uh, as we progress further and talk about the chapters of the book and so on right so one other value i think you know you briefly touched upon is indexing for the long term right and now this is something that is very difficult to do when you see the world around you sort of breaking right and also i mean when you look at a founder's life i mean every day there's something or the other some, some crisis or the other you're in operations mode uh, right you're plugging various leaks and so on and so forth right in this kind of a mindset what is your advice to founders on how they can index for the long term how can they just pull back from operations and think ahead no so by indexing the long term i didn't mean that you have to pull back all the time first of all right yes pull back is is part of entrepreneurs and or ceo's job i would say more than entrepreneurs life i think uh, indexing for long term means you take decision which is long term in nature so i'll give you an example when you're looking for your co-founder when you're building your team you are building a long term partnership essentially right if your co-founder has to be with you for 10 or 15 years of journey of your of your lifetime mm-hmm. then you have to think about long term that can i work with this individual right uh, what are the real value system which brings us together skill of course is really important without it work will not happen so that is indexing for long term similarly when you choosing your investment partner right i am i going to somebody who's going to help me or i am just looking for money somebody who's giving me the highest valuation in the first term sheet right that is what i call so, so the critical ex- the best example is you have two term sheets one at you know 10 20% higher than than one which one are you going to choose are you going to also put in the personality behind that are you going to look at the firm which is going to help you more because you have again going to build for 10 15 years and this is not the only round you want to do and similarly when you are hiring your employees are they staying with you for longer term if they are not why are they leaving are they for the right reasons so those are what i call indexing for the long term first support now during the humdrum of you know in the initial days i think it's okay to be very operational because you are going to look for your first customer you are looking to make your product out you you want hustle right so the initial 0 to 1 journey is all about hustle right and then 1 to 10 is where you need to start building team you know build some basic aspects of sales marketing other things into place that time maybe you need you know 10 20% of time where strategic thinking is required but still you are in operating mode it's really after 10 million dollars where your strategic components start increasing mode so but when i said indexing for long term i said your decision making has a bit more long term in nature because right. entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is a marathon right it's not a 100 meter race right yeah i guess you have to wait with the with the future in mind basically right whatever you do so with that uh, you know let's get to the book uh, so this is a fascinating read for everyone out there the india sas story i love that it's so easily readable it's almost scannable right i mean it's split into sections like fundraising hiring and so on so you can really start anywhere in the book and it's also a book that uh, i think people will revisit a lot right i mean kind of like a manual like an operating manual uh, so again kudos on the book so how did the book really come out how did you take time out of your busy schedule to write and compile this book Uh, thanks roshan I, i'm glad that you like the book i think the this is paid forward mindset that we have you know when grish krish suresh and avinash started saas in 2015 our idea was to build a community for saas at that time saas was like you know we a bunch of people in the room trying to figure out what the saas is all about we went through very basic so so over the last 7 years or 6 and 1/2 years now if you look at it we have come a long way right of course 
the macro opportunity has also played out so certainly saas is is extremely important to the software world now but what we what i thought was you know we have done a lot of work over last 7 years and a lot of pay forward work by community of 1000 people has been done in saas for me and the knowledge is not really kind of captured in one place today if, today we are seeing you know hundreds and maybe thousands of companies going entrepreneurs starting saas people are pivoting into saas we are finding some b2c founders coming to saas as well so when they are coming in how can we get them something by which they can scale the company faster right a single biggest objective is how do we make india as a product nation which means how do we indian companies can scale faster when we building india for global right so therefore the idea was to create a kind of compendium of learning or mistakes or experience experience is nothing but you know all the mistakes put together right in a way what went right what went wrong so that was the thought process that we should consolidate all the learning that we have with top 25 entrepreneurs and so that anybody can take this start anywhere read about it understand the experiences so it is not prescriptive in nature it's very experiential in nature it tells you about you know what experiences people went through and their journey is in that context right like i started in 2004 when nothing was here in terms of product ecosystem greece started in 2010 then other companies started starting in 2015 why more is come much later right and now people are starting in 2022 when things are very different so now you can look at this book understand okay what was the initial mistakes made what were the good points which worked out and let me see you know what i can take what i cannot take and every point in time is different so it is not going to be directly you know relatable but the learning is going to be pretty much the same that's reason we also have about 15 20 key concepts which are applicable if you use the right side pages we have put the key concepts which will the timeless concept which are required for product building or market opportunity so that is the idea behind the book basically how can you scale the company faster and therefore help india gain more market share in the saas world right yeah i kind of think of it as institutional or ecosystem memory right in in some sense i think you're documenting these things that will act as a precedence for uh, you know a lot of people coming after right i mean to just see what has happened uh, and it's also extremely experiential as you said i mean it's not theoretical stuff i mean it's people who have gone through this stuff lived it and who have sort of uh, uh, gleaned some insights from it right and these are people that you know girish and krish and so on right but did you have any surprises when you were talking to them i mean uh, in the process of compiling the book I think you know as I said we have been involved in SaaS for me since 2015 and we have 1000 companies and we do regular events as annual events so there's no surprise as such we have been tracking the market for a very long period of time I think the combined knowledge was a surprise for me also like what you're saying you know ecosystem memory I think when I look back and look when I when I went through this hours and hours of interviews with this this entrepreneur right I think the sheer amount of learning that ecosystem has gone through is is tremendous I think that was the biggest surprise yeah. for me because in day to day life I have also not realized that you know ecosystem has come so far you don't realize you know unless you sit back and you know talk to people and you know when you compile everything you go oh, wow that's like huge amount of fear india has come from almost 0 to 100 in this case i would say it is it is massive massive achievement for an ecosystem to come here yeah no i mean uh, so <laughs> i was reading about a story of how one of snap deals key revenue streams is a saas business right now you know and uh, that was actually funny to me because you know 10 or 15 years back obviously there you could count uh, perhaps you know how many of these saas businesses were right and so you started eka in 2004 and like i mentioned hardly any product companies or saas companies at that time maybe as a whole or a tally and you've seen this ecosystem evolve over the last 15 years plus how do you compare what we are seeing right now with how things were at that time you know what are those things that have changed and we can perhaps discuss you know some of these things in detail in follow up questions but broadly you know your top two or three things that have changed in the time yeah so i think i am a big believer of a macro first of all which is a market opportunity so we have to give a lot of credit to credit to the market opportunity how it has unfolded right way back in 2004 ilex started with enterprise software right which is a license you know client server based software it was not saas as such so market opportunity was very small for indian companies at that time because primarily it was license based software feet on street model you know it you have to build you be we have to be in the market to build it india was a, still not at a software adoption curve right as we started going into it by 2010 i think we started seeing an advent of cloud a little bit more you know i think amazon and it is aws in azure started coming in picture a bit more so therefore cloud started becoming a little bit of mainstream especially for the sme businesses right because previously in a, if you look at the client server only large companies use software SMEs would never use much of software. So around 2010 times, and that's how you see the advent of you know Freshworks and Zoho become start becoming very big. Where they were focused on SME market to start off. Right now, of course, they are in in, in mid market uh, enterprise segments also. So that was the first wave of SaaS where SMB started you know buying software on cloud. Right. So therefore, they have something which can buy for cheap price. Try and buy that that whole Salesforce kind of era started entire era. Right. They also started by selling to SMB. If you remember. Then after 2015-16, you know if you look at it, the enterprise adoption happened in a big way because at that time. you know entire security everything the cloud even uh, infrastructure of aws and azure really really you know also progressed and matured and therefore market opportunity will become bigger and then pandemic happened right where is the 10x on everything because every, everybody is now going to cloud so i think the first learning over 2004 to now is that it's a massive macro which has played in a uh, you know it was first software eating the world now saas eating software right mm. 
exactly so that is kind of macro which is played out right number one. number two i think india you know we have been trying to build the product nation for a very long time if you look at it right there have been many companies even before saas when we started right which have tried so the macro was not in fit so in this case i think what has happened is that we were able to form a community which could consolidate its knowledge and bring together that has helped a lot see what we see today is huge amount of startups coming people are successful but people don't realize is there's a lot of fundamental work under the hood which has happened over last 7 years for everybody to come to the scale right today if you go back in 2015 we didn't know how to build the products for saas you know there will always be you know, will be always say our products if you go back to media also you will see articles our indian products matching with the silicon valley products right today that's not even a, nobody even asked the question yeah today we're at par or something even better than products created anywhere in the globally right today the question is relative is can we sell in market as effectively as those companies do so that always happened because you know we have built that entire knowledge base consistently and built upon it and continue with the belief so i think these are two biggest learning one is the how market landscape has evolved and number two is your entire system uh, ecosystem learning that has come together and i think that's where i uh, you know kudos to all the people who have contributed so much to this ecosystem volunteers and people who have been at it yeah. so i think these are the two biggest learning from a market growth perspective no for sure i think uh, the sheer amount of product talent that we've uh, gotten over the last 10 12 years i mean it's it's just mind boggling i would say right i mean you pick up any indian saas product i mean i think it's equally if not better than some of the international products out there look at postman and all they are like yeah you know, exactly yeah. There, yeah yeah and postman i think probably uh, i don't know 50 million 100 million developers uh, using it uh, across the world which is again rivals perhaps github uh, in the in the scale uh, of its use and stuff adoption and stuff same, so same with browser stack right they build right. their testing automation suite and you know they're yeah, building for people yeah. in the internet so massive massive yeah so when you talk to founders these days you know i mean how are they different because some of the things i mean we've ha- we've hosted 150 plus founders on the podcast and some things that i see right now that were that are extremely different are obviously a lot more ambitious right way beyond uh, what it was uh, earlier right also a lot more savvy you know i mean earlier the quintessential founder was uh, someone who found a problem to solve when he started building a product right but now i mean people are you know cognizant of the market that they are operating in they are a lot more educated about the different stakeholders in that market what are the priorities what are the challenges etc they really have a very sound knowledge of the market also right so when you talk to founders you know what are some things that you see different I think you said the right things I think obviously ambitious I think ambition was also there before even the people who came in 2014 they always always were ambitious as well maybe the scale of ambition has changed but I think the biggest thing I see and this is kind of a emotion more I think it's the belief I think it's the belief that I, I'm going to build a scalable world class company here so now people don't even you know if you go back people were thinking about can you build a 100 million dollar business people are talking about billion dollar endeavor now right so I think the scale is totally different and the belief is is a totally different level altogether right and of course the, the quality of entrepreneurs also change a lot I think we are seeing very much better talent coming in you know really good really good people who are leaving their jobs or or coming out of uh, very good institutes and starting up uh, as teams and in b2b you know it's not a winner takes all market against b2c mm-hmm. where there will be one flipkart and one amazon and one facebook you know b2b you know you can have you know crm for example if you look at salesforce only has 20% market share of the crm market so 80% is still with you know maybe another 20 50 30 players right there are 500 companies vimo is in crm right so there are 500 companies in crm space itself so that's another advantage that we see but in terms of the biggest change is belief and the scale of ambition i think not just ambition right i think another facet is how people are building for the global audience from day one right i mean earlier i mean it used to be you know built for india maybe scaled to southeast asia apac and then maybe europe or asia right i mean that whole path would take you know 5 to 6 years maybe uh, before you start selling to a global audience but today i mean people think from day one they think uh, you know global right and and of course i mean covid has made uh, things plenty easier on that front right i mean with zoom sales and and so on right yeah so so i think the biggest another big changes i have also a chapter in the book called india advantage if you look at it to flip to that i think you will see yeah. what the biggest change in favor of indian entrepreneurs in india is the digital go to market advent of digital go to market today you can do desk selling to smb and to enterprise sitting in india mm. that i think is a game changer and also customer success from india right so that i think is a game changer now whether it will remain 100% or it will be some hybrid model yes we'll have to remain and see but fact that now if from india you can build the entire go to market motion is going to be a game changing for india to scale because previously if you look at it founders necessarily have to move to the us they have to hire people in the us while you can do that but that put you in disadvantage with somebody who was already born and brought up in the yeah. us environment right now if you're able to build a company in your environment you know to scale the people and technology and company sitting here that is going to be a huge advantage to us i think right i think All the good market and customer success i think is a big 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 change absolutely i think the next leap uh, next big leap forward for us will be the sales and marketing talent that will develop in india i feel right to catapult the product talent that we already have yeah i mean that that's an exciting change that will uh, happen over the next 5 10 years uh, i think right fundraising used to be very different earlier right i mean uh, 
I think around about the time you were uh, you started Eka, I think there was a there was perhaps Helion Partners and Axel. I mean, those are two names that I recall. Today, SaaS is so hot that uh, everyone has some sort of a thesis and everyone is investing in SaaS, right? There is no single VC who don't focus on SaaS as much. How has you know fundraising changed in that time, right? And how should funder how should founders look at this availability of capital itself in terms of attracting the right kind of money, deploying it the right way, and and so on? Like I think that is linked to the market opportunity. Two thousand four. Very little market opportunity, very fitness understanding. And 2010 onwards, some bit, as the same, I think it has followed the curve of market opportunity. 2019 onwards, after pandemic, it is a confirmed secular trend that SaaS is going to replace your software, enterprise software, step by step, mm-hmm. step by step, 20% per annum. So that is confirmed across the board, right? Because all enterprises and mass is moving to cloud, right? Mm-hmm. So therefore, money is going to chase that opportunity. So therefore, you're seeing more investment coming into the market. Number two, the interest rates have been very low, right? You saw that you know, a huge amount of money got printed in the pandemic. So there's more money available than it ever has been, right? Three to three, three and a half trillion dollars got printed. That's a huge amount of money, right? And which asset class is giving more return? It is software. Yeah. Whether it's B2C, whether it is B2B or other forms of technology, right? So therefore, the allocation of capital towards technology has increased in a massive way. So therefore, more money flowing in, more money flowing in, which means more fund managers or existing funds have more money to deploy capital. So therefore, the availability of the capital for the technology software works is going to remain big in, in the coming years. That is the move on. So therefore, if I'm an entrepreneur, it's an advantage to me that I can now, as you said, my ambition is very big. I want to scale the company faster, make a really big business. So therefore, I would raise proper capital, but I would use it really on first principles. That is the biggest learning for an entrepreneur. Raise capital at the right time, but use it really to build your business with first principles. And that's what, you know, I learn a lot from old economy businesses, the Tata's and Reliance, you know, they, it's not that they don't, they also have to raise billions of capital, but look at the utilization. They build real businesses with real mm-hmm. money, with real people. So that's what I think the B2B has to follow the same curve. And services, IT services is another great example, right? They build the entire $180 billion industry without even raising much capital, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you look at some of the valuation multiples, right? I mean, it's kind of scary at this point of time, right? I mean, like I saw some recent funding news where someone had a 60x uh, forward multiple, in fact, on projected revenue, right? Which is, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that must impute like a tremendous pressure on the founders to sort of deliver, right? Founders and their leadership teams and so on to deliver on those staggering growth numbers, right? And, And these are not, you know, I'm not talking about late stage sort of things, right? I mean, even series A, series B type of companies. So how do you weigh that? You know, I mean, how, what would your advice be to founders in terms of like these kind of things, right? I mean, money, valuation, looking at the next two years, looking, thinking of the next round uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think uh, so valuation has two, two, three dimensions to it, right? First is when you're raising capital. So when you raise capital, you raise a good valuation, then you use it properly. That's one, one part of it. Second is if you're raising at 60X, you have to look at in 18 to 24 months time when you raise your next round. How are you going to look, right? If you raise too high, then you have to achieve a lot, as you're saying, before your second round happens, right? Or the next round happens. So it really assess that will I be able to go to that round? You know, what can I achieve with this money that I've raised? So therefore, if you're able to, you know, excel to your sales, build the product, go to next level, of course, your valuation will still continue to get good money. And third, and which is very important, is that all this valuation only has meaning when a, when a company gets or or a, or a entrepreneur gets an exit. And it's all paper money, right? You can be very happy saying, yeah. you know, my, I'm a unicorn or I'm whatever I've reached, but I have to we have to go for an exit. And I'm not talking about exit means just selling the company. It could be an IPO. It could be real revenues. So ultimately, basically what I'm saying is unless you're able to utilize the capital you need cash flows and revenues, you're not yeah. going to get a valuable company. I would not bother too much about, you know, multiple goings up and down. Multiples have already come down by half now. It's no more yeah. 60X. You know, it's, market is now trading at, you know, 10X, 12X, 15X multiple, right? So private market will also soften. Typically, there's a lag of three to nine months depending on how much money is available in the market. So valuation often, you know, will come down from the highs. But you're building for 10 years, right? So if you look at 10-year horizon, you should look at what the valuation will be in 10 years' time, not today. Right. In terms of skill and talent itself, right? I mean, again, we've come a long way in terms of this, right? And and you mentioned like over the last 10 years, how product talent has grown, grown and so on. So if you kind of objectively look at the skills and talents required to build a SaaS company today, right? Where are we sort of lagging behind? What can we do to sort of catch up with, let's say, Silicon Valley? And uh, do you see that happening? Uh, do you see like some yeah. trends on that front? So I tell you, see, if you look at it, as I said, we've been able to put up pretty, pretty decently that I think at a, at a global scale where we have lacked so far historically is investing in go to market to the same scale. You know, in McKinsey report, we did a benchmark also, the Indian companies typically spend only 25% of their revenues into GTM as against the US to 60%, right? So there is a massive difference there. Not only the scale of investment, also the time of investment. You pretty much have to start building a go to market motion or start thinking about it as you started building the product right from the start. 
Mm. That was not happening in parts. A lack of knowledge. B lack of capital as well, right? But now, as more capital is available, people are taking bigger risk. You have the option to start building go-to-market motion as you're building your product. That's the biggest thing which has to change, which is beginning to change as well now. I think people are very aware now. They're looking for talent who can help with that. So our real crunch is coming in talent actually. Now money is available, awareness is there, but talent is not there. Like you said, Ian, we still have to build the sales talent, right? We still don't find inside sales people at the same scale. We still don't find marketing people at the same scale. We still don't find product managers at the same scale. And of course, engineering crunch is also going on with the entire data transition wave going on. So I think talent crunch is going to hurt us a little bit in the short term. Right. You speak very passionately about the post sales and customer success uh, function, and that's something that I am also really interested in because oftentimes in SaaS, I mean, you realize that there's so much money on the table, right? I mean, even past the first time that uh, you contract with a customer, what are two or three things that have worked really well for you and that people should uh, definitely mind when they're building these uh, functions out? I think first of all, I think most of the things starts with the awareness. If entrepreneur knows that customer is going to be very important for me because it's churn, it's lifetime value, and it's my relationship with those customers. Uh, so that is the first part. Then I think after that is the question of uh, allocating the capital and hiring people for it. I think today you you find a lot of services oriented people. I think a lot of services people coming from services firm are also very focused on customer success. I think then you're just talking about how do you put those account managers or customer CSMs, customer success managers, allocate them across your accounts. I think the magic will start happening. Right. So the book is full of learnings, lessons, everything. Right. And I'm just curious for founders who are listening, what are some three mistakes that they should avoid? You know, three killer mistakes that they should really stay away from. I think the first mistake is get the founding team right. If your founding team is not right, you're going to continue to fight with each other and, you know, get your founding team getting yeah. right is critical to success and critical to your mental peace to build the business first, right? So that is the first thing you have to get. Second thing, which I think still people I see is a little bit weaknesses is an understanding of market opportunity. A lot of time you start building first thing that come to you or even you pick up some things. You don't spend in enough time upfront to focus on the market opportunity. So if you really want to build a good business, your market opportunity has to be, at least you have to have a very good understanding of market opportunity. That'll help you a lot after a few years once you get to some revenue, right? Because you don't want to get stuck at $5 million and no, my market was too small. Now I have to pivot or do something else because that, then you're going to lose time and, and you don't, may not get investment as well. So, so I think understanding that market opportunity, which geography, which area, what horizontal, vertical, that I think is, is a mistake I would avoid. I would focus a, focus a lot on it. And third is invest in go-to-market from day one. I would not wait to invest in go-to-market. Right. Yeah. So I want to pick up on the second one that you mentioned, right? I mean, which is the market opportunity asset. So if you look at a lot of, I won't say a lot, but some SaaS solutions, right? I mean, they're still coming off as a nice to have because maybe I guess, I mean, that adoption curve has, hasn't happened. And in fact, I feel any solution will go from a nice to have to a need to have. Now for founders who are kind of in that journey, right? Going from a nice to have to a need to have, what are some two or three things that they should optimize for and that will make that transition quicker, faster, more seamless for them? Okay, when I was talking market opportunity, I was talking about even the mission critical software, the market has to be understood. But another dimension is a lot of new categories getting come, coming, right? Dev tools, for example, so many tools you have mm -hmm. to build to manage your infrastructure, performance, cloud, cloud user interfaces, uh, API, where Postman is an example, right? So you have to understand how, if you're an infrastructure player, you have to understand how is that coming. Nice to have. And the other is, I think you just have to go and understand and talk to your customer in the market. For example, culture building. Now we all in the remote, I'll give you an example, live example, right? We are in a remote work right now. Now, how do you build culture in the remote? So if I bring a software, which can help you in building the culture remotely. Will you adopt it today? You know, most of people think there's no ROI. I can get onto Zoom or can get a team. So now, so entrepreneurs have to work extra hard mm -hmm. to really prove the ROI and saying, okay, this is important to you and this is really going to be important. Like what Slack did with, with the entire collaboration, right? They literally mm -hmm. kind of brought collaboration to the forefront. Without that, before that, you know, collaboration was a problem, but it was nice to have, right? We'll say, okay, fine, we have emails and we'll figure it out. We will meet, there'll be calls. And Slack kind of created a category of collaboration. Yeah, no, Slack is a great example, actually. I think back in 2012, 2013, uh, you know, people perhaps uh, exchanged files on Slack and had random chats. But then, I mean, today it's the workspace for remote, right, as they call it. Uh, so that's where nice to have turns to, turns to have must have now. So what I'm saying is it, it follows the trend. So as more technology curve happens, you know, you tend to get more and more usage. Right. So this category creation is a critical thing that people are going after right now, right? I mean, uh, everyone literally wants to create a category and, and there are so many of these examples like Drift, for example, with conversational marketing and so on and so forth. What are your thoughts on category creation? Does it happen organically? Is it something that you can plan for on day one? What would like, what would you do at this point of time if you had to create a category? I think category creation ultimately is serving a fundamental need somewhere. I think it's understanding of that basic fundamental need which makes a difference. People are able to adopt and shape those needs. So basically, your need to do work efficiently always remains. If you look at even Word document and then now Notion is coming and you know all these companies are coming in. It is shaping up your need basis how your the world around you is changing. So category creation is happening basis that, right? Email was the most productive tool out there before that, right? So people created more. Google Gmail came and the other, you know, 
enterprise software companies who focus on automating your entire uh, email experience, right? And then, you know, in this case, Slack picked up that, you know, it's not only email, it's your exchange of documents, it's problems. Let me make the life simpler. So I think, so category creation uh, companies or entrepreneurs have to think that how do I make my life simpler for the end user I'm focused on? Like what Notion is doing. Notion is a great example, right? It's a combination of your Excel Word, a little bit of database, a little bit of, you know, everything together because today I'm doing all these things. I have Google Sheets, I have Google presentations, I have Google, so I'm doing three things in three different documents, right? So Notion kind of brought everything together and kind of, kind of creating a new operating system of work for, for people. So it's changing the behavior. So I think, so categorization typically happens with get insight into the need and then shaping up the behavior around that. Right. So I will stop at this. I mean, I, I, there are plenty of facets that, you know, we can delve into, but I really want people to pick up the book and read it because it's, a, it's an amazing book. I have a last couple of questions left. What do you hope the book will achieve? You know, what will make you happy a year from now, maybe three years from now, when you look back on this project? Yeah, if somebody says, you know, I started SaaS company, I picked up a book, I learned and I made less number of mistakes and therefore I've scaled faster. That is the biggest compliment. I'm sure uh, that will happen. Also, what are your plans for the future now? I mean, you're, you're straddling multiple things, right? There's ACA, of course, and then there is SaaS Boomi and the Together Fund and so on, right? So what do you have planned personally and professionally for the next like 18 months or so? So I think I see it all as a, as a passion to build India as a product nation. That's what I'm saying. I'll be very happy when India gain more market share in the software world, basically. So all these initiatives are towards that. So we'll just continue to scale those. I think we're in, in a very good position. Just continue to scale things that there, which can lead us to gain more market share globally. And that's a real passion I have. I, I'm really driven by that. Right. I think, uh, you know, I read somewhere, you have this ethos of Seva. I think that is reflected in a lot of the stuff that uh, you're doing, which is pretty amazing and also very inspiring to know. Uh, before we leave you, Manav, uh, any books or podcasts uh, that you would recommend? Of course, I mean, this book is a must read, uh, but any other books that you would recommend? You know, my favorite book, of course, you know, I, I got exposed to Bhagavad Gita very early in my life. I was very fortunate, you know, my grandparents used to read that quite often and I took a more scholarly route to that. So that is my go to all time favorite book. I suggest it to everybody. It also helps fully in your mindfulness. It right. gives you answer to a lot of things which you may not know today. And every time you read it, you can find different answers from it. So yeah. I would say that people, for entrepreneurs, that's a must read book. Yeah, it's the book of books, I would say, right? It's the true epic. <laughs> yeah, it is. Right. So thank you so much, Manav. This was a fascinating chat and thank you again for writing this book. I think it's extremely important uh, and it'll be super useful for all the founders out there who are going to build uh, the next billion dollar SaaS company. Thank you so much. Enjoy the conversation, Roshan. Thank you. Thanks, Manav. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, then don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform and share this episode with all of your fellow startup operators. Also follow the startup operator on LinkedIn and Twitter for more updates. Stay safe, take care and see you soon on a brand new episode of The Startup Operator.